President Biden said an invasion could happen in the next few days. How high is the threat of a Russian invasion right now? It's very high. Every indication we have is they're prepared to go into Ukraine, attack Ukraine. Is your sense that this is going to happen now? Yes. Not, I, my sense this will happen within the next several days. Joining us now to talk about this and more is U.S. Representative Mark Green, who's a member of the House Armed Services Committee, the Foreign Affairs Committee, the Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Crisis, as well as the House Freedom Caucus. He's also a GOP Doctors Caucus. He represents the 7th Congressional District of Tennessee. Congressman Green, welcome to the program. Thanks, Joseph. Glad to be on with you. Well, we are glad to have you. First, what's your reaction to what's happening on the Ukraine-Russia border? Well, this is, uh, it's almost unbelievable, but then you look at who Putin is and and you say, okay, I, it, it looks like it's happening. Um, I mean, he is basically assembling uh, an invasion force that we haven't seen in Europe since World War II. Uh, 190,000 soldiers uh, of course, he's got naval forces and Marines ready to assault from the Black Sea. It's just uh, it's unprecedented. And uh, it, it really spells trouble for for Europe and for the world. Is there in any sense that this has been could be avoided from a diplomatic sense? Are there diplomatic steps that could be taken that might avert this? Well, you know, that's two questions. Uh, is there something that could have done, could have been done in the past to have kept us from getting to this point? I think a, a, an effective withdrawal from uh, Afghanistan with a commander in chief who appears strong enough to to deter something like this would have been incredibly helpful. We don't have that now. We have a failed withdrawal that has uh, empowered our enemies. Uh, energized them. Uh, so I don't I don't know that in the past there's anything we could have done, you know, other than have a different president. Um, in terms of the go forward, it doesn't look like there's anything at this point that NATO, EU, and the U.S. would be, that we should do. I mean, Putin's ultimatum is akin to the ultimatum that the Serbians gave the Austrians that started World War One. I. I mean, this ultimatum is intentionally written, knowing that we can't accept the terms of that. Uh, and Putin echoed it again, you know, again this morning. So it's, I think we're at, a, we're at an impasse diplomatically. Um, we should continue to try, of course, but I don't, I don't see anything that Putin wants to have happen that we can, you know, uh, make happen. In a 3,000-word document from the Russians earlier today, they seem to be making the argument that they're actually trying to protect their security in this sense. What are they claiming their position is? Well, from Russians' perspective, they believe that the activities of NATO expansion, meaning adding states like Poland and Romania, and, and the possibility that we might add Ukraine in the future— uh, presents a security threat to them by putting the forces of the West on their on the Russian border. You you look at even back to the czarist times, the the czars of Russia and and of course the Soviet Union, they protected their country through proxy states or through buffer states surrounding the country, and and that's how they have secured or created security for themselves, and that's what Putin wants to resurrect, um, but. You know, in this case, NATO is there in po Poland now, so it, there's an Article 5 obligation to protect Poland. Um, and it, he's just not going to get what he wants, uh, unfortunately, for him. Uh, and so now he's going to do it with Ukraine as quickly as he can before they become a NATO ally. Well, in that sense, he would be moving the border instead of NATO moving the border, wouldn't he? Because if he were to take Ukraine, then he's just moved that that much closer to Europe, which he claims is the problem. Am I misunderstanding that in any way? Well, no, but that creates the buffer for him, right? I mean, he, he gets a, the buffer state of Ukraine between between Russia and, uh, and the West. Yeah. Is the international community prepared to go to war to stop Russia? 
I don't think uh, anyone in the West is talking about putting, you know, either NATO forces or, and we certainly aren't, you know, I am fully against, and I think most of the American leadership is against putting U.S. troops on the ground in Ukraine. And now, honestly, the Ukrainians don't want it. I, I visited Kyiv just a few weeks ago as a part of a congressional delegation. I was the lead Republican in that delegation, and um, you know, the U- Ukrainians were very clear they don't want American soldiers there. They they are willing to fight if they have the equipment. So um, I don't see the West doing that. Now, the West is going to you know create incredible sanctions. Um, and and that they're going to cripple the Russian economy. Um, I do see us bolstering our forces in NATO countries that border this buildup. You know, you look mm-hmm. at him massing troops in Belarus, which happens to be on the border of Poland and the Baltics. And so we we have a responsibility to those allies to make sure that he knows any attack against them will be, you know, met with stiff uh, military, kinetic, everything. So. You talk about sanctions that would cripple the Russian economy. What would those be? Well, clearly, if we disrupt their ability to do dollar-backed trade or banking transactions, their ability to trade internationally would be severely impacted. I mean, it it would keep them from buying wheat. It would keep them from buying, you know, other products from other countries. So, I mean, it, it would essentially cut them off from international trade. Presumably Putin is aware of this and he just doesn't care? Yeah, they prepared their economy. It's interesting. They did a very good job of preparing their economy, their reserves, their conversion of their reserves to Russian currency versus, you know, dollar-backed currency. They got rid of all their dollars. Uh, They're in a better place. It still will be devastating to their economy, though. Congressman Mark Green, I want to talk about another subject with you, Uh, our neighbor to the north in Canada. uh, A lot of action from their government in response to the trucker protests. What are your observations there? Well, one, you got to love the fact that our Canadian brothers uh, and sisters want freedom, too, right? I mean, they're they're standing up uh, for freedom, and I, I deeply respect that. And it's been interesting to watch the totalitarianism of Justin Trudeau. I mean, but he's the guy who praised the dictatorship of the CCP only, you know, months before this. So uh, he's overreacted. This emergency powers that he's claimed is is ridiculous and absurd. Uh, there's no threat to the sovereignty of Canada here. Um, and, and I think it's going to backfire on, on Trudeau. Now, there's a clip of President oh, – okay, excuse me. I, I, I was – I'm going to stay on, stay on the Canada story here um, that the, their in, invocation of these emergency powers, how unusual is this even in Canada now? That, of course, they have a different government. They don't have the same constitution we have. They don't have the same Bill of Rights. But in a Canadian context, how unusual are the steps that Justin Trudeau has taken in the last several days? To my understanding, this these powers have never been enacted ever before. So this is uh, brand new and, uh, you know, just something that no one in Canada ever expected would happen. And it's never happened before. Now. What the Canadian government is doing, using these emergency powers to essentially turn people's lives off, and the technology now gives them that ability to stop them from being able to buy or sell or travel literally anywhere, those powers are really a function of new technology that have developed in the last decade or so. Is there anything that we in the United States should be learning as we watch what's happening in Canada? Well, we sure surely shouldn't elect leaders with an authoritarian bent. And you take uh, the folks in the far left that have seized power in the Democrat Party, the woke cancel culture, the, uh, you know, authoritarians over there with masks on children and closing down schools and all of that stuff. We, we got to make sure we elect freedom loving uh, leaders to our to our Congress and to our governorships and to our state legislatures. Uh, and certainly to the presidency. So that's probably our biggest lesson, because 
You know, we've got people in our government who are leftist Marxists who want to do what just they're fine with what Justin Trudeau has done. So that's probably lesson number one. How can we make sure that the United States government does not have the power that they could exercise where they can essentially turn off the lives of American citizens who fall into the displeasure of the federal government? Well, I'll give you a great example is make sure that H.R. 1 is defeated. The bill that would permanently empower the Democrat Party, it would federalize elections, uh, you know, take away the state's rights for elections. Uh, that, that would be a good place to start as well. H.R. 1 it would devastate freedom in America, and it can't pass. And, of course, you know, the leftists, they want it to pass. So we've got to make sure that it doesn't pass. We've got about a minute left, but one last question. The timing of Canada's extreme measures is interesting because at the same time, they are really uh, doubling down and, and, and moving harshly against their citizens. Most of the globe is opening up, and it seems that the requests that the trucker protests are making are policies that essentially the rest of the world are adopting just because they think that's the right thing to do. What do you make from the fact that Canada is going extreme at the same time the rest of the country is opening up? Well, I, I think, you know, those guys have got to reevaluate what they're doing. This, this, uh, this mandate stuff, uh, even in our Senate, though, we had some senators who did not support uh, shutting down uh, government funding and mandates. So, I mean, it's this is a battle that's ongoing everywhere, and we got to just keep fighting for freedom. Congressman Mark Green, we do appreciate you continuing your fight for freedom and for your time today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joseph. See you.